Hello, and welcome to the HMCT Design Educators Typography Intensive, everyone. I'm Gloria Condra, the Executive Director of the Hoffman Smoken Center for Typography, and I'm your host for the next two days. Um, effective teaching should be shared, not a secret, and that is the heart of the DETI. And we continue the legacy of Professor Leah Hoffman Milken, who for over three decades left her mark on students and future generations of thinking designers. Um, I want to thank, and all this is made possible by a generous support from Google and so sponsorship from Google uh, and support from Art Center College of Design and the Lowell Milken Family Foundation. Um, our second, this is our second DETI, will focus on branding and typography. Um, all of our programming aligns with our mission of elevating and advancing um, both the understanding of letter form design and typographic practice, and especially providing valuable support for educational and professional communities. Louise has been here with me. Hi, Louise. Hello. Um, because she has graciously agreed to be our first keynote speaker of the event. And I cannot think of another person who is probably an icon. You're an icon, Louise, when it comes to the voice of typography and letter forms as it leads a, a, a brand narrative. Um, you're a creative director, you're a graphic designer, you're a type designer, you're, you're an author. We just discussed you've designed over 2000 book jackets unbelievable and you say you do that that's what you do when you're sleeping <laughs> or when you can't sleep um you have co-authored and authored so many books i you know elegantissima grafica della strada that's not bad very um, good thank you um graphic de la rue grafica de las rambles etc 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 um you're a gold medal recipient from uh, AIGA, Lifetime Achievement Award. And um, I can't say anything more, but um, stop talking, Gloria. And uh, please welcome Louise. And Louise, um, please share your screen and I will disappear, but I will be here for you if anything goes wrong, okay? No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. All right, I may be an icon, but let's see if I know how to share a screen. <laughs> All right, we're here. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you happen to be. Um, I thought we should go to Italy right now. Uh, and so I can tell you that a brand is only as good as its typography. Even when you're branding a seaside town in Italy, like this one, which has had the same signage for nearly 100 years and continues to be a great source of inspiration to me. When I started as art director of Pantheon Books, it was at a time in book publishing when everyone seemed to think that type on covers had to be big and vulgar. And I was on a mission to prove that you didn't have to shout to capture someone's attention. The cover that I did for The Lover is probably the best example of that. When, when I would design a cover, I did everything I could to avoid using standard typefaces. Instead, I would take a tracing pad, I'd draw a five and a half by eight and a half rectangle, and then I would take the title of the book and I would write it over and over and over again, page after page after page, just letting the words speak to me. And it would go from an amorphous jumble of letters to something more precise, which was a letter form that didn't exist. And then I had to go about trying to find out how to create it. So without realizing it, this is how I learned to design logotypes, which I didn't start doing until much later. And after 11 years of branding thousands of book jackets, it seemed like as good a time as any to start my own studio, where I learned the importance of having your own personal projects. It's the only way to grow as a designer and find your own voice. So I started with what was closest to my heart, Italian Art Deco, of course. And this became a series of books on Art Deco graphic design that I did with my husband, Stephen Heller, with highly branded covers because I had two rules. We would always put a woman on the cover 
And even more importantly, we would always design a font for exclusive use in the book that was based on a type treatment from one of the images inside the book. The series did very well and then of course drifted into a remainder of purgatory as they always do. And after which we came out with a hardcover edition, Eurodeco with selections of each of the books except for American and yet another new type treatment. So after years of branding the outsides of books, it was time to explore the interiors. But there was always one aspect of book design that really, really annoyed me, and that was the copyright page. This is, you may not be aware of this, but this is one of the first typographic treatments that you see as a reader. It's usually on page four, and it's filled with dreadfully dull legal information that has to be set line for line exactly the way it's given to you, or so they said. So one day I was doing a gardening book and I set all the text in centered lines for the copyright page and I looked at it and I thought with a few changes, this could look like a tree. So I showed it to my son who was two years old at the time and he got it. So I figured I was home free, but then I had to deal with the copy editor who was apoplectic at the idea of this typographic blasphemy. Uh, she, she's, she kept saying it's never been done. Is that a reason not to do something? So I, I showed a lot of historical reference because I certainly wasn't the first designer to ever try to contour type before. I showed Marinetti, Apollinaire, fell on deaf ears. Finally, I got the publisher on my side and I won my case. With one of these under my belt, it was much easier to convince the next publisher who tried to say no. So this is a book of poems to Edward Lear. This is a rather odd book called You Can't Be Too Careful by an Englishman who had collected newspaper clippings of strange ways that people had died. Aperitif. This was a collaboration with Art Spiegelman called Wild Party. A lot of drinking here. A Guide to the Best Tea Shops in the UK. Lost Words of Love. Writing New York, and I was lucky enough to have the Empire State Building right outside my studio window at, at that time. And I'd always wanted to build the Eiffel Tower out of type, and I got to do it twice. A book of photographs of the Twin Towers and a book of photographs of volcanoes. A guide to the artisan shops of Florence. Cuban Deco, and a series of cookbooks, one on chilies and another one on beans. A baking book for my client, Sarah Beth, and that was followed by her book on breakfast and brunch. And we even blind embossed this into the, um, into the cover of the book. And this was for a monograph of my work, Elegantissima. So remember that it only takes one person to say yes, and that can make all the difference. So if it weren't for that publisher, I wouldn't be showing these to you today. And that's why every time I see her, I thank her again. So next I embraced the curious world of restaurants and I quickly learned that in New York City, this is the number one business most likely to fail. But on the other hand, I always had a table until the restaurant closed. So I found myself designing logos for eateries with unpronounceable French names owned by people who were neither French nor could they even speak French. So the branding and especially the type had to work miracles. The logo for a spa, same owner, was inspired by an old French sign painter's manual in my collection. And I wanted the logo to look like a classic Parisian hand-painted sign. So I actually talked the client into letting me have an enamel sign made for the restaurant. And when the place closed, the, the sign came to my studio. And Metro Grill is in the Hotel Metro, thus the uninspired default name. 
And in these preliminary sketches, I was intrigued by the realization that Metro and Grill not only have the same number of letters, but they have a shared R. This is one of those things that designers go crazy for, right? But I eventually decided that the backward and forward italic treatment had more potential. And since the restaurant is located in New York's garment district, I opted to have the logo made into an actual stitched clothing label. Minimum quantity, 5,000. So we use the extra labels on the menus along with the remnants from the restaurant's upholstery fabric because all clients always wanna hear that this won't cost them anything. Metrosaur was located on the mezzanine of Grand Central Terminal, now home to an Apple store. The restaurant was named after a train line along the French Riviera, so I decided to make the business card into a luggage tag. And I try to use letterpress whenever I do branding for restaurants to communicate appetite appeal. And letterpress on both sides was the easy part, but getting someone to add that grommet and string was the very, very difficult part. Artisanal was a French bistro specializing in cheese. So the idea was to make the logo look like a, a cheese label. But by the time we got to the third iteration, the client had already changed the spelling of the name. And while most cheese labels are round, artisanal is really a little too long, especially now with an A instead of an I, to fit comfortably around a circle. So we opted for an oval shape. And this is the business card, which was die cut it into an oval on extra thick stock, which, which made some diners think that it should be used as a drink coaster. Another restaurant with a default name. Can anybody guess what street it was located on? It's not easy to create a logo for a two digit number, but when I took the subway up to the construction site for the first time, I found myself studying the mosaic, the mosaic tiles more carefully than ever because I've always been quite enamored of them. I went back with my camera and I photographed every nine and every two on both the east side and the west side on different color backgrounds. And with the wizardry of Photoshop, the brand for 92 was created. Outside of New York, you wouldn't be expected to know that this is a visual metaphor for the New York City subway system. But there are even some New Yorkers who don't know that 92nd Street is not an actual stop on the train. But I have to say that after working on this for as long as I did, I became convinced that there actually was a 92nd Street stop. And then as I was looking at the files, I noticed an outline layer and I knew that we had our children's menu. So this was given to every kid in the restaurant with a red, yellow and green crayon. The client was very happy. He said, this will keep them busy for a long, long time. So the original name of this restaurant was Italienne, which is the French word for Italian. And this is what we first presented to the client. Whenever I start designing a logo, I make certain automatic decisions. Um, for example, when a word is this long, I know that I'm gonna to have to use an ital, uh, I'm sorry, I know that I would use a, a condensed letter form or a script if, if the word is something readable, but in this case, that, that was not so. And so the client selected the last version of the most condensed one, and they chose the colors which clients sometimes do, even though we provided alternative color options that I preferred. And then a year later, they decided to slightly change their name to Trattoria Italian. And uh, we did this new logo, but, but this time we got to choose the colors. So one day, two clients came to me and said they wanted to open a restaurant that feels like a seafood shack that you would stumble onto while you're walking along the beach in New England, except that you happen to be in the East Village of New York City. I would never dream of hyphenating a word in a logo, but this was the time to break all the rules, so we did. And then when they opened a sister restaurant, Mermaid Oyster Bar, we flipped her and we put a pearl choker around her neck. 
And the lettering was all drawn with a mouse. And then Pizzeria Sirenetta opened next door and we had to determine a way to hide her breasts because Sirenetta means little mermaid. So we, and we also didn't want anyone to think that this was a place making seafood pizza. So I thought that making the logo into a tomato can label was a great idea, but the clients did not agree. So instead, we covered her with a rolling pin and an apron and with a double hyphenation this time. I've always been fascinated by metal script signage in Spain, which was the inspiration for the logo for Chiquito, a Basque restaurant in Manhattan. And I've learned a very important lesson from this logo, which I highly recommend to you. Not being familiar with the language, I had thought I should check over the spelling just before the client presentation. And sure enough, I found that each of the hand lettered logos that we were about to show had two transposed letters. So instead of Chiquito, we had Chitico, which is not a word. This is not a recommended way to impress a client. These were the other options that we reworked right before the presentation. So what would this type from our French note cards have to do with a pizzeria, you might ask? The clients of this pizzeria in Santa Barbara were interested in pursuing two visual directions. A protea, this, this tropical flower, and Mediterranean citrus, where I got a chance to use my font Montecatini, which had just been released. So after some deliberation, the protea version was chosen. And although we were asked to change the tomato red, which seemed like an obvious choice, colored choice for a pizzeria, to match the blue-green background of the citrus version. Pearl was the first authentic oyster bar in New York City with which chef owner Rebecca Charles had been running for 15 years without a logo, just this hanging sign that her sign maker had done. Could you tell? Based on Rebecca's mother's speedball lettering book from the 1940s. I love this book. Using a style she selected called Stunt Roman, which is better left forgotten. So I decided to keep the logo in black and white and in the same dimensions as the original sign, but to make it look like it had been crafted by a better than average sign painter. So Pearl is a really good example of why I prefer to work with small businesses, if you haven't noticed that already. A few minutes into our first meeting, Rebecca and I discovered that not only did we live in the same neighborhood, but for years, we had been peering into each other's bedrooms. This is so New York, right? The same night I went home and I left her a message, a tradition which continued every year on her birthday. At some point, my landlord cut down our shared tree to Rebecca's great distress. Shortly after that, my landlord passed away unexpectedly and Steve and I had to take our leave. After our last night in the apartment, I left one final sign in the window. It's probably still there. And for Claudette, a Provençal restaurant on Fifth Avenue, the logo exploration began by referencing French scripts from my 1930s button cards. Along the way, the clients decided that they wanted a wrought iron sign for the facade of their building. How often does that happen? So we needed to design a logo that could be crafted out of metal. And the sign came out so well that I ordered another one to include in my retrospective exhibition. When the exhibit came down, can you guess? I brought the sign to my studio. And these are two esteemed women chefs, Jody Williams and Rita Sodi who joined forces to open Via Carota, named after the street that Rita grew up on in Tuscany, Via della Carota or Carrot Street. 
And they made it quite clear from the start that they had absolutely no interest in seeing either a carrot or a street sign in their logo. I could do without the carrot, but the street sign was a real missed opportunity for me. Now, this is my version of a mood board. This is my conference table covered with Italian reference for our initial meeting. So there are books and orange wrappers, labels, monograms, all kinds of packaging, and of course, signage. So we talked about a possible monogram, a crown, and an unusual shape for the business card. And it was clear that Rita's taste was more minimal than Jody's. So I kept that in mind as I chose these directions to work with. I showed samples of monograms in this scrapbook of mine from the late 1800s. And then we flipped through my collection of labels. They liked this one for the shape and also for the embossed dots around the border. So by the end of the meeting, we had something to work with. We had two styles of typography, we had a shape, we had a monogram and a possible engraving. So we agreed to meet again for the presentation at my studio in four weeks. And so when we met for the presentation to everyone's surprise, I began by showing the logo as a classic Florence street sign, only because it was a stepping stone to the first exploration. A fantasy street sign, taking elements of a normal street sign and elevating it more elegant and refined for Rita's taste, but with a playful quality for Jody. And next, the monogram option, even though this was meant to be a presentation for the logo only, I'm always curious about how these options will translate into other components, like a tray, which since it fits so well, and it's much more effective to present an idea as a physical object rather than a PDF. So the monogram was followed by my preferred option referencing letter forms from Italian Art Nouveau or Stile Liberty, as it was called, often found in hand lettered posters from that period. So the clients opted for this design, although some of the letter forms were too ornate for their taste. So the curl in the C and the crossbars of the A's had to be more restrained. Claudette had made us relax the curl in their C as well. From there, we did the matches, coasters with a monogram, and the oversized menus, which fit perfectly into the back pocket, once meant to hold a Bible, of the chapel chairs that were ordered sight unseen from England. And although Via Carota does not take reservations, it is well worth the wait, especially now that the owners have opened Pisolino, a very, very tiny and authentic Italian bar cafe, which is right across the street, and which is an ideal way of passing the time while you're waiting for your table at Via Carota. The logo was meant to be a distant cousin of Via Carota, so we kept the same shape and color, but we stretched it horizontally to accommodate the longer name. And although I'm always looking for an opportunity to put quote marks around a name up and down, a, con a conceit that I often see in Italy, they were not interested in that, although I did find a way to use them later on, which you will see. So the brand is everywhere in this very tiny space. Die cut business cards, espresso cups made in Italy, coasters printed with items from the drink list, a patterned wrapper for a pinguino, which is a chocolate covered gelato. Cocktail doilies. And of course, a mosaic monogram on the floor to greet you as you enter. So this restaurant is owned by chef Francesco Butoni of, of pasta royalty. And the logo for his Italian trattoria was created in my studio's kitchen. That's why I have to have a, a kitchen in my studio where we tried boiling 
bucatini, linguine, and spaghetti, all at different cooking times to find the most suitable for a script iteration. Bucatini was the winner. And although the client had originally requested blue for the logo, since most pasta packaging is blue, it was later changed to red and with a die cut business card. So Bettina changed from red to blue and Jobata from blue to red, go figure. Especially since it's well known in this business that blue is not a food color. And here's the matchbook with a pasta chart inside that we put together. And their sign when it isn't snowing. So this is a conceit that I've been attempting, I've been attempting to use for years. Since 2001, I have been trying to sell a restaurant on this idea, but so far, no takers. For the Harrison, it was too Italian. This was to introduce the Friuli region of Italy to New York City, but it wasn't New York enough. This was a nice Z, but no thank you. A competition for a new Italian restaurant inside of a cinema, the chef lost the contest. And Sfolia is a restaurant specializing in handmade pasta, which was perfect, but instead we had designed a better logo option. Same thing for Via Carota. And the same for Giobatta. They later had buyer's remorse and wanted to change from Bucatini to the fork. And I said, no. So when I was in Milan years ago, researching the Italian Art Deco book, I came across this trove of pasticceria papers from the 1930s. These were beautifully patterned wax papers, all hand lettered to wrap pastries in shops. And this is what made me decide to shift my focus to include food packaging. And one of my first clients was Bella Cucina. In spite of their name, they are not Italian, but they're from Atlanta. Fortunately, they're not afraid of hand labor, which is what designers always wanna hear. So a lot of what we do in food package design is about makeovers. When a food producer starts a business, they rarely have the know-how or the budget to hire a real designer. Then five or 10 or even 25 years later, if they're still in business, they'll realize that they've reached a point where the quality of the graphics does not measure up to the quality of the product. And that is when they call me. I love makeovers because it gives me enormous satisfaction to clean up after someone else's mess. I've also come to realize that you can change a lot as long as you, as long as you maintain one or two key elements. So Sarah Beth had been in business for 25 years when she decided on a change. I, I took one look at her label and I knew that the printer had been designing it. It reeked of Microsoft Word. Why else would it say under Sarah Beth's name? Let's take a look here. Spread the word in italics, quotes, underscored and in red, and it means nothing. So the first thing I told her is that that line had to go. Um, but she was nervous about losing her, her uh, existing customer base. And I said, look, we'll keep the same jar that everybody's used to seeing, except why does it say Mason on it instead of Sarah Beth? And we'll keep the same uh, oval shape so you won't have to buy a new die, but we'll upgrade everything else. We'll keep your name in upper and lower case, but better typography, better illustration, even better paper stock, because you could see on the left that the paper stock was kind of dingy. And I went to a lot of trouble to find the brightest white and in, in the most opaque um, kind of paper stock. So even though her regular customers would keep reaching for the jar and may not have noticed the change right away, they suddenly had a higher regard for the product. And that was carried over to her other products, hot chocolate, coffee, coffee cups for, at her bakery, and for her restaurants in Japan, a fan. 
With Tate's, we kept the color, sort of, and the rectangle. And we changed everything else. The boxes were designed to reference milk cartons. And then the company was sold for $100 million, and they changed the packaging. American Spoon had also been making jam, a jam for 25 years. Although this was a family business in northern Michigan, and it was all about the fruit. The owners had a personal relationship with all their, their growers. So if the black raspberry crop wasn't good one year, they just wouldn't make the jam. So now I really wanted to communicate the human interaction in the logo. So I com commissioned my wood engraver to do this illustration, which is stamped on the lids of the jars as well. And I hired a second illustrator to do the botanical images for the labels. I find it interesting that it took two British illustrators to convey this very American brand. Everyone should have a gelato client. A Sicilian diamond cutter came to New York, but he missed his hometown gelato. So he decided to make his own, which I can honestly say is the best in New York. Although when I met him, I told him that I would never set foot in a gelateria with a logo like this. The lettering and design was influenced by the pasticceria papers that I showed you. And as part of the arrangement, there is always gelato available, which is a good way to keep staff and clients happy. In New York, the branding is everywhere. The carts are on the High Line and at the Guggenheim. And they even have a vintage Fiat Cinquecento that was brought over from Sicily. And yes, the three of us were actually inside that car. So the only thing better than having a gelato client it's having two gelato clients. The original packaging for this company was laughable, but with a new container and classical typography, it was taken more seriously. And it was this makeover that taught me two important lessons about food packaging. One, a good package can actually, a good package design can actually make a product taste better. And two, a bad name can seem less bad when it has a good logo. I tried to talk them out of the name, but they wouldn't budge. Gelato fiasco. So this is the freezer on a typical day at the studio. Whenever I have a client presentation, I schedule it for the afternoon at the studio. I serve gelato first, and then I show the work. I find that if they aren't interested in the gelato, then they should be my client. This is an example of before and after and after. Not too many New Yorkers know what a salumeria is. It's a shop selling pork products or salumi. And it was, so it was essential to include a pig in the logo design to communicate the meaning to the uninformed public. The client was offended by the playfulness of the pig. So in the end, our logos were not accepted. However, I was approached by a restaurant in Texas, which happened to be another Salumeria. So they used this version, but unfortunately they closed in less than a year. After which a whistleblower in New Jersey alerted me about this logo, which a restaurant owner had bought online from a designer in India for $39. A blog called Logo Thief had a headline that read, Marie's Deli gets a Louise Feely for a steal. Marie's agreed to cease and desist. And there's always something good to drink in the studio as well. All of these wines were imported from Italy. So I decided to design the labels as mini posters that reference typography from the early 1900s. And Svita, the one on the far left is an aptly named wine. It means challenge in Italian which is exactly what it was to make all of this text fit into a label of a very specific size and shape. And every now and then we'll do something that is not food related, which isn't nearly as much fun. This was a monogram for Tiffany, which needed to be used as small as, a, as for a winder of a man's watch or as large as a construction shed. 
And we had several choices for configurations. These are some initial sketches. So we could do a T and a C, a T, C, and O, a T ampersand C was endless. And this is what was presented to the client in a book. And they chose the, the third from the left, but uh, of course they wanted a little bit bolder, which everybody wants. Uh, and these are two publishers. Echo is a division of HarperCollins. And Hyperion is the publishing arm of Disney. Disney studios are located on Hyperion Avenue and Hyperion is also a daylily. Everybody's gotten something from Paperless Post. And every woman is wearing hanky panky right now, I'm sure. With a name like this that already comes with built in cute, it wasn't necessary to do any more than link the Ks. These are two hosiery companies importing yarns from Italy. And I suggested that instead of using paper bands that every other sock manufacturer uses to opt for a woven label, after all, I had a source for that. And it cost a little more, but it was worth the attention that the brand got. And it gave me the opportunity to use this style of letter form that, that came from Italy and Spain in the 30s. And this is the brand for my dentist who has a very fancy office on Madison Avenue, which offers state-of-the-art equipment and a complimentary foot massage with every visit. So he needed an elegant brand. And this was for Crane Paper Company. The idea of nesting seas was in reference to the Housatonic River, which is where the Crane Paper Mill is located. So I've taught at the School of Visual Arts for over 30 years, and I've had the opportunity, along with many talented colleagues, to contribute to the school's very distinctive brand. Every year, the school publishes a book that showcases all of the work of the graduating senior de graphic design majors. With, um, and, they, and each year, they invite a different instructor to design it. When it was my turn, I decided to make it into a beautiful box of chocolates. When you open the box, it seems like an actual box of chocolates, but I fooled a lot of people. Many students were disappointed when they discovered that what was inside the bo box was nothing more than a book. And these posters were for our annual master's workshop in typo typography, excuse me, in Italy, which ran for 10 years which gave me a perfect excuse to travel there every year. And the first years were held in both Venice and Rome, then finally just Rome, which was a lot easier for the poster design. This of course is a classic uh, Roman street sign. So to catch someone's attention legally in the New York City subway system is no easy feat. School of Visual Arts is known for its long history of posters in the subways. And when I was invited to design one, I decided right away to create a mosaic. And given that we had already done that for Restaurant 92, I thought, oh, we already know how to do that. But what I didn't take into account is that a two digit number is a lot easier to do than a 13 word poster. My staff will never forgive me for the tortuous month that was spent putting this together tile by tile in Photoshop. By the end, we all agreed that it probably would have been easier to have done this in actual mosaic tiles. It was underground for a two month run and then it came above ground as a 38 foot blow up on the side of the SVA main building. And just by chance, the yellow arrow right here point, was pointing not only to the main building here, but also to my studio, which is right over here. The next subway poster was due to come out in April and after a, br after a brutal winter. So I knew that everyone would be craving a big dose of spring. So I made it into a seed package, burying the SVA logo. Can you see it? It's right here. So when I was asked to design a third poster, I knew that I should start with the logo this time since it's such a nuisance to work with. What would the logo look good stamped into? How about chocolate? 
So the poster became a chocolate wrapper. So having collected many, many Italian pencil boxes over the years, I decided to create my own double-sided perfetto pencils in red and black with those up and down quotes that I've been trying to use. That's the good thing about doing your own projects. And then we did colored pencils called Tutti Frutti and Brillante with metallic colors. For over 30 years, I've been traveling to Italy in search of signs. And each time I try to choose a city that I've never been to before and going up and down every street in search of new typographic gems like these and these. I started with 35 millimeter slides, then point and shoot prints, and then finally digital. And these had never been meant for anything more than my own reference and enjoyment, but as digital photography got better and better, and as my favorite signs began to disappear at an alarming rate, I felt a sense of urgency to put the images into a book before they were gone forever. So I returned to as many of the cities as I could to reshoot, and I never left home without my secret weapon, a telescoping pole, which gave me something that I always wanted in life, an extra three feet of height. And this is in Venice with a truncated version. I started shooting as soon as I arrived, discovering that all of these mosaic signs on the pavement were absolutely filthy. So I returned the next day with a box of baby wipes whatever it takes. For the signs that were no longer there, we relied on Photoshop. And I was so happy to have been able to do this book. And the most surprising thing about it was the positive reaction from the Italian press. Everyone said the same thing. We walk by these signs every day without noticing anything. And it took an American to come here to make us appreciate them. So before I had even finished the Italian book, I had started on the next, Paris. There was no time to lose in the race to preserve a type legacy. I went back with the same telescoping pole and I figured that this one would be easier. Instead of a whole country, this was just one city, but a huge city and with signage that was disappearing rapidly, especially signs like these in neon script. The last chapter of the book is called Sambo, or without words, for signs like this one, Au pied du cochon, the pig's foot, or Le chien, chien qui fume, the smoking dog. These are both restaurants. It was a great inspiration for me when I was designing this logo for Poulet Sans Tête, Chicken Without a Head, a rotisserie restaurant for which we made a blinking neon sign. Next and last stop, Barcelona. From modernista to deco in mosaics, wrought iron and stained glass. One sign that I was especially looking forward to seeing in person was a beautiful script for a photo studio, which I had only seen in a book but had been checking regularly on Google Street View. As soon as I arrived, I literally ran to the location where I found this. I was devastated. I felt like I had missed the signs removal by a matter of minutes and I probably had. The next day I was interviewed by a reporter from the Spanish newspaper El País and I mentioned my tale of woe, which was in turn noted in the story that ran a few days later. When I got back to New York, I received an email from Angel Lopez, the grandson of the original owner who said, my family and I were very moved by the article and we just want you to know that if you ever come back to Barcelona, we will remount the sign for you to take your picture. I went back immediately and the whole family came out for the event. I de dedicated the book to them. I find it incredibly ironic that it was digital photography that put this family out of business, but allowed me to do this book. A few years ago, I embarked on something I swore I would never do, font design. For all the time I've been designing logos, only the letters that are needed are drawn. 
no punctuation, no numerals, no diacritics, no interest. But when I was invited by the Hamilton Woodtype Museum to design a font to be cut out of wood and sold in the digital version as well, I decided to develop an Italian futurist inspired font, which was named Mardell after Hamilton's longtime pantograph operator, Mardell Dubeck, who came out of retirement to cut this typeface, which I was able to witness firsthand at the museum. And these posters were printed in letterpress and are sold at the museum. And that same year, I had a retrospective exhibition at School of Visual Arts, where I had to find a way to cover this eyesore of a staircase. And it merely required coming up with 12 pasta names of equal length. Next came Montecatini, where I was again inspired by the lettering from Stile Liberty posters in Italy. Now available in 24 styles, Montecatini features more than 200 ligatures which makes copy fitting a breeze. It's also really easy to make monograms with this. And this is my team. The soccer club of Sevilla decided to use Montecatini for all of their branding. I love the way the numerals look on the jerseys. And Marseille available in six weights in upper and lower case. For many years, this alphabet was my go-to elegant letter form. I used it for the book jacket of the lover that you saw earlier. And then later to announce the opening of my studio. Finally, I decided to create a font and ultimately a font family for all of my French and Italian needs. So I would say that we have now come full circle. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have a Q&A is open. If anyone would uh, care to ask any questions. Um, I, I have a few questions and we started talking about it earlier. I think a lot of your inspiration is so based on experience. And what happens when you're not able to be in the environment of type, especially because it's so much of this type that is not there any longer. So how do you, how are you dealing with it today? How am I dealing with it? Well, I have all my reference yes. that I've been collecting for all these years that I work with that I really depend on. And as I mentioned to you before, since we've been on lockdown, I haven't been able to go to my studio. I, I go there once a week just to check over some things and to take a book that I might need. But it has changed the way I design a bit. I, every time we, we design something, I always think, could I have done it better if I had been in a studio and I had all my books to spread out on the conference table? But it's, it's actually probably a good exercise to not have to depend on everything like that. And of course, I, I, we, no, go ahead. No, and of course we have the internet that has everything and more, too much, and it's not credited. So, so whatever I do, a, Whenever I look on Pinterest under Italian, vintage Italian design, I find all of my work and it's like, oh, so people can just find it there and, and then think that they can use it because it's vintage. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, quite a few questions and we'll try to get to them. Um, okay. One question I think is the fun question. Um, someone wants to know in Italy, where you were able to find the 1930s um, pesticide? Where was I able to say? find? To Let's find them, the papers. The, the teacher, yeah. Where you can find them? Well, I found those years ago. It was, you know, right. 25 years ago. And, but I know, um, I know that there is an archive that has some of them in mm -hmm. Italy called um, Ciruli, C-I-R-U-L-L-I. -L -L you should follow them on, on Instagram. They have a really great archive of just Italian great. design. Oh, that's a, that's really great. And then another question um, from Annabelle Gould. Hi, Annabelle. Um, Hi, Annabelle. Oh, what country or countries do you want to visit and explore their signs that you haven't yet? Oh, oh so many. I well, when I said that that Barcelona was the third and last book, it it pretty much is because I proposed another one to my publisher and they thought they thought that three was more than enough, even though the, the books did well. Um, so the next one I wanted to do was was um, 
Lisbon and Porto, even though Ooh. I've never been there, but <laughs> but I checked really? out ahead of time. I, I, and I looked on Instagram and there, there are some amazing signs. I hope there's still- well, I yeah, I, I, I hope we have a, quite a few. We have a few people from Portugal watching, uh, attending right now. So right. I think uh, I think that calls for an invitation. Yes, I think it does. For you to be a, a guest lecturer, to do a workshop. So anyone from Portugal, I strongly suggest that you get in touch with with uh, Louise and say, come come to Lisbon and Porto, and yes, and we can help you with your with your signage. Another thing. Um, did you grow up loving type and design? Yes. Or how I, were you influenced? When I was about four years old, I used to carve letter forms into the wall above my bed every night with this <laughs> carving tool that the father of a, a friend of mine gave me at four years old. So my father took it away from me and then I found it. And then the next night I went back and kept carving letters and I couldn't I didn't even know how to put words together at that point but I I just loved letters I thought they were so beautiful and I was always doing alphabet books and I um when I was a little bit older I I I wanted to be the next uh, Louisa May Alcott I wanted to write classics so I would start writing a book I'd write the first chapter and then I'd do the cover <laughs> and then I'd stop and move on to the next one so I guess it was all there what kind of best advice would you have for a new typography student in learning what we would consider uh, it's it's a it's a profession it's a craft you know they want to know what is the best way to get started in understanding typography yeah. and brand just look at everything you can and and there are so many more resources available now than there were when i was in when i was yeah finishing school, go to the Hamilton Woodtype Museum. Has anybody ever been there? Right, right. It's an amazing, well, we, amazing resource. Right. And then of course, if you can go to Italy, then you go to their version of Hamilton, which is Tipoteca. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's even beyond <laughs> Hamilton. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Tipoteca has really saved the type from all the uh, uh, Italian foundries. It's a fabulous, yes fabulous uh, resource and uh, doesn't um, Paul Shaw, we'll give a little shout out to Paul Shaw, yes, still does his legacy, of yes. his legacy of letters. And I agree with you. It's about, it, it's about looking, it's about experiencing. Um, and those of you who don't know about the Hamilton Woodtype Museum and Printing Museum, it's the oldest woodtype museum in, um, uh, in the United States. It's still producing. And Louise, we will buy a set of your wood type, you know, it takes a long time because here at the center, we have a huge letter press. And so whenever oh, we can, and we have the fantastic. money, we buy wood type from them. Although we have, we have a little bit of our own. But another question is, um, it's, it's so funny when someone says that the a typeface has no bearing on a brand's success. I think uh, we all disagree with that comment. You know, um, someone has heard the claim Harant has said that. And, you know, I'm not exactly sure that we can even um, address that claim, that it has no bearing, especially no bearing. with your work, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so interesting. A lot of people uh, and a lot of the attendees really want to know about your process. Obviously, right. if you looked at the presentation, you do a lot of sketching, don't you? I do a lot of sketching. Yeah, this is the first time I've done, I've done a presentation that shows those sketches because I just I finished a book during the lockdown that is part of this series. Paul oh, Rand, yes. Paul Rand, Seymour Quast, Milton Glaser. And I don't know how I fit into that group, but, um, but it was <laughs> when they first asked me to do it, I said no. And... <laughs> <clears throat> and then I started thinking about it and I thought, oh yeah, I guess I, if I dig through all my files. So I went through files that, that go back as long as my studio, that's 30 years. And I realized that we, used, we did a lot of work and I did a lot of sketches. And, um, and it's, it's, it is interesting to go back. And, and of course, I always save everything. That way I can do things like keep reintroducing the fork or, uh -huh. <laughs> or the Salomaria logo. 
I never let anything go to waste. You know, and, and, and I think that's important. I know I've spoken with uh, Stephen about sketching, the importance of sketching type, the importance of the tactile quality of actually creating a letter form. You have to have a balance between, you know, and I think a, a balance between the typography, the color is very important, especially when you're dealing with food, the patterning yeah. that you're creating, right? There has to be a marriage be between all of these elements to create a successful, especially food brand. And you're absolutely right when you said, you know, people don't eat blue food. <laughs> and it's so funny, just in the last couple of years, I've had clients specifically request a blue logo. Like I could, I, I did understand it for the pasta because because pasta packaging is blue. So that was okay. But then, then they wanted red, they wanted it to be more fun. Either that or I was gonna have to use the fork. Right, no, no, I, I know. Hey, um, yes, we eat blueberries for those who made the comment out there. And uh, some not, people eat blue, they're not, it's they're not, not really real blue. blue. Right. And, and blue is used in high-end chocolates. Right. This is what I always tell my students. I say, I always, because I teach a packaging class, the first, the first uh, class, I always tell them, you can't use blue except for pasta, chocolate, if you use it with brown, and it has to be a good blue. As far as I'm concerned, there aren't, there aren't too many good blues. And, um, and for saltine crackers, navy blue has to be used for saltine crackers. Go figure. Now, why is that? It's just the rule. <laughs> you know, it's because it's the sea and it's, and it's salt. I, <laughs> I don't know. The sailors I, eat, I guess, eat crackers. I don't know. I, I guess there are certain things that, you know, um, you know, that, that can't be broken. So in your design process, approximately, I think it depends on the pro on the on the project, but approximately how many number of iterations do you provide your client in terms of your process? Well, in my contract, I always say I used to say three options. Now I say two to three. And but I always explain that these are very, very finished looking options so that right. they don't have to use their imagination for anything. I mean, those ske those sketches that I showed, today, I would never show to a client um, right. ever <laughs> uh, because then they'll think that that's exactly what it's going to look like, or they'll be disappointed when we give them the finish. So um, we show, so now we show two to three options, but, and that's why I showed the process for Via Carota. But the, what I do before I, I start working is we have a big meeting and instead of a mood board, I have my table and I, I like to go over the different directions that I want to go into and which which puts a lot of pressure on me because I have to kind of figure this all out bef before we we really get going on anything and some clients are more articulate than others but you know like if I'm doing say um, a logo for a, a wine importer I'll say well you know we might be able to design the logo as a as a wine label or maybe as a, a red wax seal or maybe as a, a grape leaf, you know, and, and I could show them different examples of that because I've got all the reference in my studio. And then we'll talk about what kind of typography. So so at least we'll have some basis to work with. And that way, when they come in for the next meeting, they're not they're never going to say, oh, that's not at all what we expected to see. That yeah. never happens unless unless suddenly they bring in a decision maker that they didn't tell me about. Because that's the other thing about the meeting is that I always insist that all the decision makers are present. Mm -hmm. And if somebody- I think that's important. Very important. And I always, and if they say they're too busy, I'll say, well, I'm too busy too. Because there's nothing worse than and somebody I, trying to second guess their boss. No. And I assume that this is exactly, do you lead your class the same way you would lead your project in the studio? Is your class basically constructed around the same way you would interact with a client in the studio? Yeah, pretty much. In fact, with my class, I never give them a, a written brief because I said, this is mm -hmm. the real world. I'm going to treat you the way, my, the way my clients treat me. No one has ever given me a brief. 
you know, that I, I have to play 20 questions with them. It's like, what's the name? Have, has, it, has it been trademarked? Those are the first two questions. <laughs> Because I I can I have been very surprised sometimes at the people who haven't thought of doing something like that who you would think you wouldn't even have to ask for, um, but I just ask a lot of questions uh, and I like and then I want to know what the interior design is like. Do they have images of that that I could look at, uh, and then I'll and then I'll pull out things to show them. Um, but you can't expect the client to be very inspirational. That has to come from the design. If someone wants to know what you consider what makes a design successful. What I consider that makes a design successful. Mm -hmm. Well, it needs to be memorable. It needs to be readable. It, so that's interesting, readable, because someone yeah. wants to also know about legibility. So you legibility really is really important. You know, if, if there have been times that I've seen logos and it's like. Is that a Q or is that an O? What, what is that supposed to say? Um, you shouldn't have to do that because especially now where you're, you're gonna wanna Google it and having you Google it if you have no idea how it's spelled. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, yeah readability, it shouldn't have to be a, a lot of work to right. know what the name is. Well, name recognition. I mean, there are so many, again, shape of uh, shapes, make an important, especially in the food and food packaging, you know, a labeling, a shape yeah. that can be memorable too. Um, I, it's very interesting. I, I think one of the most difficult things that we go through as instructors is how do we convey to students how to choose a typeface? <sighs> do, you, do you say yes? Do you say no? I mean, you know, there's so much a student can choose from today. Yeah. Well, this the next thing I tell them at the first class is I don't want them using Helvetica. Okay. Unless they can show me that it, that there's a reason for it. But um, I mean, I think you could do so. You could maybe do food packaging with Helvetica, but it's what I try to explain to them is that Helvetica is something that you should use when you want to, sh to have no personality. And, mm. and food packaging is all about personality and tactility right. and appetite appeal and all of that. But I usually give my students a, uh, a number of fonts just to, at the first class, just to help them start moving because some of them just don't have a clue on when it comes to choosing type. And this, with some of them who um, have the ability to do some hand lettering, then I encourage them to do this, to work the same way I do. It's just like, just draw it out and see what it becomes. And then even if it, if, if, if it's a matter of looking for something that that looks kind of in the realm of that that face mm -hmm. that they've drawn they can use that but at least it started in a more organic way mm -hmm. which i think is important because it's it's got to be emotional yeah i i you know and again you know letter forms and type really do embody the a voice and that's where i think we always try to tell our students that there's a reason you choose one typeface over another typeface. And the other, the other reason, and I think a lot of, and, and I think you can also agree, is you must look at the word that you're working with. Not all typefaces work well with certain letter forms that are sitting next to each other. That's the first thing, right? I mean, that's you right. must look at the word. I mean, that's extremely important. The name of the restaurant, the name of the food right. product, and then say, well, this typeface will work better than that typeface just because that A and the E work better together. Yeah. You know, and I, sure. and I think that's for everyone to know. So we have one more question and it's, okay, this is a great question. And I think everyone should write this down, the answer. Um, someone wants to know if I wanna buy one of your books that showcases your body of work, which <laughs> ones do you recommend? Oh, well, body of work. Take this yeah. down and it, yeah. <laughs> Um, it would be what? <laughs> it would be uh, Elegantissima, but that's, that's been out okay. for a few years now. So you, sh you should buy my new book oh. when it comes out, and which is going to be in, I think, May or June, the one that's in this series from same publisher, Princeton Architectural Okay. Print. But, but if you're interested Check in Amazon. signs, then any of, any of the sign books are definitely helpful. Right. And any of the S books right. that Steve and I did together, we did scripts 
shadow type, stencil type, and slab serif. Right. Slab serif, right, right. And we do have uh, quite a collection of the books oh. here at oh, the HMC. Good to hear. Well, because we, we, we have an archive, we have a library, and I think it's very important. I think it's important to build a library, and you do have a huge library of books between you and Stephen, which is great. But anyway, Louise, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank all. you for your wonderful good, presentation. And good luck to all of you. And the, well, and the generosity that you bring in sharing your process, right? For and for worth. setting the bar so high <laughs> for typographers and designers. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank Gloria. you again, Louise. Thank, thank you. you. Thank good you, luck everyone. to all of you. Bye. Bye.